Today I want to talk to you about a false doctrine that almost killed me. If you've watched this channel for a while, then maybe you've seen my testimony video. I will link it at the end uh, where some of this is covered. But I wanted to go a little bit deeper into a part of my life where I got involved with the church that was seemingly great from the outside and a doctrine that they were teaching that nearly drove me to death, drove me to suicide. Um, you know, I was raised in a Christian home. It was a church of God. So that's like a Pentecostal church, charismatic church. They believe in the Bible, believe in the gifts of the spirit, all of that stuff, which I still do. And I still operate in the gifts of the spirit. Um, but in my parents' church growing up, my dad is the pastor. Um, you know, there was maybe it's just because of my relationship with my dad. I don't really know, but there didn't seem to be um, a heavy emphasis on grace. It was more emphasis on sin. And, you know, therefore that produced a lot of secrecy in my life, my brother's life. Um, you know, we were trying to maintain this image of being perfect. So I'm sharing this for a reason. So I grew up in a home where, you know, it felt like I had to have it all together. Um, and if I sinned, I better be on my my knees repenting before the Lord immediately, um, you know, and then there was an emphasis on the gifts of the spirit, prophetic, speaking in tongues, all of that as well. Um, but fast forwarding, I left all of that, joined a band, just completely walked away from the faith, walked away from the Lord altogether. Um, sex, drugs, rock and roll for several years, did that, just wanted nothing to do with God, didn't even think I believed in God anymore. All of that. Went, well, a few years later, in my early 20s, I came back, got back in church and became the worship leader. Um, you know, and then I decided I was going to leave my parents' church and, and branch out and go to other churches, meet other people people my age because I wanted to find a mate. You know, it was my mid to late 20s I was getting into, and uh, there wasn't a lot of people my age at my parents' church. So that's what I did. And I, I went to a church because I got involved with a girl who was on a worship team, and um, she was great at what she did and all that. And, you know, so I, I, I kind of started going to the church for that reason. And like I said, from the outside looking in, this was great. It was a charismatic church. Um, but once I went, I realized is way more charismatic than the church I grew up in. I mean, there were flags everywhere. There were people painting. There were children running everywhere. Um, even during the service, while the pastor's talking, I read a book by the pastor. It actually changed my life. It was an amazing book. It's about the cross and what Jesus did on Calvary. And it completely... Uh, changed my life because I had a revelation for the first time of what Jesus had done for me. And this was at about 28 years old. I feel like is the first time I actually really got saved. Although I was doing all those things in church before, because I didn't actually realize what Jesus had gone through and done for me. Um, so there was a uh, fruit out of this experience. But as I started going on, in life, I noticed, uh, you know, a lot of the the mentorship, I guess, or the relationship that I had with this individual, um, you know, and I started to hear her thoughts and her doctrine and her beliefs. I noticed how vastly different they were from the ones that I grew up hearing. And there was so much more about the grace of God, the goodness of God, the love of God, and all of things I knew and heard. But I guess um, to me, the grace of God was very limited. You know, he was a, a quick tempered God. He was always ready to strike me down and beat me over the head. Um, and again, this could go back to, you know, how me and my teen years was with my dad and we didn't get along because I was rebellious and I was out of line. Um, you know, so I always looked at God as, you know, wanting to uh, punish me rather than love me and show mercy and grace and all of these things. So I, I kind of kept this distance. So this new message of grace and love and all of that, I had not heard it in the way that she had described it. Um, if you've seen the movie Jesus Revolution, I don't know, but um, I, my wife and I went and saw it and, you know, I thought they did a pretty good job with the movie. But our mentors um, that we currently see and that counsel us and we hang out with, they were actually saved during the Jesus Revolution. And they were sharing with us some stories about the 70s and this time period. And it was really fascinating to hear them talk about that and how the time uh, right before that, why this was so significant, the Jesus Revolution, was because the church was so 
legalistic at the time. It had become so religious. You've heard the term hellfire and brimstone, Turner burn. You've heard all of those terms, you know, and all the things that we see movies mock um, Christianity. They use a lot of that stuff. That's where it comes from and comes out of. So people were afraid of God. People didn't weren't flocking to church. People didn't want anything to do with it because they felt it was a list of rules that could never be um, upheld and it was impossible and hard and God was always mad at you. Um, so then Jesus revolution comes along and people start experiencing the love and the grace and the mercy of God and having real experiences with him. That's why all the hippies came, um, you know, it was all about love and peace and all of that. And then the, the music stuff started out of it and it just exploded because love is something that everyone has in common. Everyone wants and everyone needs as a human being. So that's why this uh, era was so significant and so many people came to know Jesus. So many churches were planted and a lot was um, done in the name of the Lord in a, a productive way. But what we do as humans, I mean, we're on a, we always repeat history. The Israelites did it. They get close to God. They get back into the favor of God. And then, you know, and then they start adapting back into the culture and they start sinning against him, turning from him. And then he has to pull them out of their mess again over and over and over. This is what we do as a people as well. And we're still doing it. So through this, you know, if you've read the book, uh, The All of God by John Bevere, I recently read that. It's an amazing book. Highly recommend it. But he talks about this in this book, uh, in this part. And, um, you know, he said, imagine it as a road and there's a ditch on either side. And the American church was in the, the left ditch of legalism um, and religion. And when Jesus revolution came along, we started to get back on the road. We started to get back to the fullness of the gospel of Christ, which, yes, there is the wages of sin is death and there is punishment for sin. But also there is grace and mercy and love in the father. So um, but now as we've gone on and on and on, more than 40 million people have left the church in the last 20 years and people were leaving the church in mass numbers. We've gone over into this overly grace uh, or near uh, almost lawlessness where is what we're approaching. We're now in the church. Everything is acceptable. Everything is okay. We don't really talk about sin, all of that stuff. So when you hear me harping about the church, this is kind of some of where I am coming from. And this is not a blanket statement about all churches. This is not, uh, I'm not saying this is a fix all. If you're experiencing some of the same stuff I was or a cover all for that, uh, you have to use your own discretion and ask the Lord to show you what's going on with you. Um, but I know God put this on my heart for somebody to share today, and that's what I want to talk about. So as I got involved in this church, I realized, you know, behind the scenes, a lot of the musicians, a lot of the people involved in the church were not at all living a lifestyle um, that I would call godly, that the Bible would say is godly. In fact, in the church I was raised in, like, the sinners that would be talked about was describing the leadership of this church. You know, they were partying, they were sleeping around, uh, you know, all this stuff was happening, but, but they were all so in love with Jesus, you know, and the gifts of the spirit were real. I, I had prophetic words given to me that came to pass. They were very true. Uh, it was, it was really wild to see you know, these people operating uh, so charismatically and in love with God, but yet their lives were kind of a wreck behind the scenes. And so, um, but at the time I wasn't much better. I was still in a, a phase in my life where, you know, I was going out drinking all the time. I was going out partying with friends. I had two groups of friends, you know, God, uh, God fearing friends. And then I had uh, party friends and I was living a double life. I was still doing drugs from time to time. I was sleeping around all the time. I was looking at porn. I was doing all of this stuff when I found myself into this church. So for me, this was a breath of fresh air because God was no longer mad at me for my sin, but he actually loved me and accepted me. And, you know, I could operate in prophetic gifts. I could lead worship. I could sing songs. I could do all of this stuff and not have to change my lifestyle at all. So what that did is develop in me, um, it, it really started to quench the Holy Spirit's conviction in my life to the point where I, I ended up getting a DUI. 
I was sleeping around. I was back on drugs. I was everything that I had fought the last few years to get out of. I was back in, but this time deeper than ever before. Me and that girl only dated like a month or two. But for me personally, this doctrine that was being preached was not the full gospel of Jesus. It was not the full Bible. It was not uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It wasn't the fullness of of it. There was a huge lopsided emphasis on spiritual gifts. And if you were spiritual and you were operating in spiritual gifts, you had a crowd around you and everybody thought you were great and people would praise you. Um, you know, people were writing books and all this stuff and they were exalting these people, but they were actually behind the scenes living a life that would make a lot of us ashamed to see. So I laid down a few things that I noticed about this experience in my life. And, the, and it's important that we pray for these people. And this is important because the enemy is out to kill, steal, and to destroy. And he is absolutely a deceiver. I know for a fact, if I would have died in that season of my life, I would be burning in hell today because I had no regard for sin. I did not fear the Lord. I had completely lost the fear of the Lord. And I just thought he was my buddy. I thought he didn't really care about anything I did as long as I was going to church and playing music and prophesying. Like I wasn't, um, I wasn't trying to save souls or, or witness to people. And I wasn't doing anything, but I was doing everything the world said to do. I talked like the world. I acted like the world. I did everything the world did, but I had Jesus. And I was so deceived. And so many people in, and in that church and came out of that church was in the same boat. So I wrote down a couple things I want you to look for. If this is you and you know what I'm talking about, or you've walked through this, or maybe you're currently in it. And I call it a false, false doctrine for a reason, and I'll get to that, but it exalts spiritual gifts over a life of holiness. Now, both are important, but obedience to Christ is paramount. We, The Lord, he did not say, if you love me, prophesy. If you love me, speak in tongues. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, Paul does tell us that we should earnestly desire spiritual gifts. And that's why I say I still do. And I operate in them. I do desire them. I do seek them out. But nothing is more important than expressing our love unto the Lord by saying, God, I'm going to choose you and keeping your commandments over my sinful flesh and my sinful desires. Because when we just live a lifestyle the way I was living, I was actively denying what Jesus did on the cross for me and taking taking advantage of it, saying, oh, well, you died for all this, so I'm just going to live any way I want. And I was so deceived in that thinking. Also in this scene, in these kinds of churches, charismatic characters are often heard and listened to over the more meek and quiet folks. So if you have Sister Sue that is just so faithful in the secret place, she's always praying, interceding for people and in church, but she doesn't really say a whole lot next to Brother Bob, who's very charismatic, loud, always has a word from God, always has something to say, always has something to share. But Brother Bob is caught up in porn, cheating on his wife, doing all kinds of stuff. But hey, he's got a word for you. People are will tend to listen to that loud, charismatic voice that always has a word over the one that is always seeking the Lord, always in the word of God, that is operating out of that place of wisdom and discernment. And the loudest voice in the room is not always the correct one. I have never in my life, all the times the Lord has spoken to me prophetically, I have never heard Holy Spirit scream. I've never heard Holy Spirit tell people to sprint around, roll on the floor, act crazy, act drunk, all of those things. Actually, when I read the Bible, the people that are doing those things, Jesus was casting a demon out of them. So that's that more aligns with being demonized than it does than being filled with the Holy Spirit. Some of us need to get back to the book of Acts and read the Bible again because we've forgotten what this stuff actually looks like. We've forgotten what this how this actually operates and that there is order. The book of Corinthians talks about the order to spiritual gifts and the church. Uh, some churches have seemed to have forgotten or omitted that book of the Bible. So number one, it exalts spiritual gifts over a life of holiness. Number two, it often does not talk or warn about the demonic or sin. They say things like, I assume people already know they're sinners. I don't need 
to tell them. You know, this is the one that probably led to my detriment. You know, I know I have a responsibility to read the Word of God for myself, to have a prayer life for myself, but I didn't. You know, I was seeking it out from spiritual leaders. And, you know, they never once talked about sin. They never once told me that forgiveness was required. They never once told me about, um, you know, the book of James, it says, confess your sins one to another so that you would be healed. So I found myself in these addictive sins and habits of porn, drugs, drinking, sleeping around, all of these things that I could not get out of. And I would do it. I would feel guilty and I would pray and ask for forgiveness. You know, and then I would find myself back in this same cycle over and over and over. I did not realize that there were open doors that I had allowed demonic forces in that were influencing me, influencing my thoughts to act in this way. And I didn't know about doors. I didn't know about breaking agreement. You know, it's a lot of these people, a lot of the church is highly ignorant about the spirit realm and how it works and what open doors are are that is leading to demonic activity. Yes, there is power in prayer, but we must break agreement and close the doors we are willingly keeping open through our sin. When we sin, we keep an open door. We give the enemy access to us. So number two, it often does not talk or warn about the demonic or sin. Number three, takes no personal responsibility. In this church, in this season of my life, nobody took any personal responsibility for their actions. Everything was super spiritual. The devil made me do it. If I sinned, it was the devil made me do it. If I messed up, the devil made me do it. You know, when they actually did consider something sin because nothing was really sinful. And we're seeing this same spirit infiltrate the church today with all the alphabet people stuff going on with everything and, and what this month is now started to represent in America and that they're celebrating all of this madness is coming to the church and people are accepting it and churches I never thought I would see accept this stuff is because of the pressure of the culture. It's a demonic spirit and it's because people are ignorant and we've gone overboard on this grace doctrine and we've forgotten that God is a just God. He does judge and there will be a judgment day and God does know the intentions of our heart. Number four, it operates out of feelings or the flesh rather than in the spirit, according to scripture. You know, I mentioned this before, when we read the book of Acts, we see how, uh, you know, spiritual gifts should operate. We see how things like what those things should look like. The book of Corinthians tells us, um, you know, the, the biblical order for spiritual gifts and things of those nature, but we cannot rely on our emotion for that is of the flesh. So much of church now is designed to get an emotional reaction out of you to to make you think you're having a spiritual experience and it's not true. It is, I, I'm not saying this is across the board. I'm not making this a blanket, blanket statement, but it is very deceptive of the, of the enemy. Look at what's going on with the Hillsong crowd right now, that thousands of people are leaving the church. A lot of the people leaving the church don't even know if they believe in God anymore. I don't know if you saw the recent documentary, but there are people that are now proclaimed atheists that were going to that church and no longer at that church because of what happened, because of sin happening behind closed doors. And this is the importance of talking about it. I know we're human. We all sin and come short of the glory of God, but repentance is an important part of the Christian walk because no one is perfect and no one has it together. The Bible tells us to walk by the Spirit and to walk by faith and not by sight. We cannot walk by how we feel. Many people like myself end up tangled in sin, hopeless, lost, and have no idea why. Guys, I was in a place where I literally wanted to kill myself. I compl I Once me and that girl broke up and I left that church, I went on my own endeavor and I was out of church for almost six years. And I... I still loved God. I still believed in the Lord. I still prayed from time to time, you know, here and there when I needed something. But I had completely reverted all the way back to even worse than I was when I was in the rock band. Drugs, sex, rock and roll, doing it all. I did not care. I had no conviction about it because of this new grace doctrine. I'd, I'd gone so far as to think I don't even need to be in church anymore. I can just kind of do, you know, God wants me to have a 
career. God wants me to pursue film. God wants me to do all of this um, stuff. And he's with me no matter what, which is true. And all of this is laced in a little bit of truth. And that's what makes it all the more deceptive. But I was a vagabond. I was this um, loner out there trying to do my own thing with no regard for the heart of God, with no regard for the fear of the Lord, with no regard to keeping his commandments whatsoever. And I got so deep and it's to such a dark place. I literally wanted to take my own life, but thank God he intervened. He intervened and that did not happen. I got through it. The Holy Spirit met me where I was, but then I, when my wife and I got married, married and we moved to where we're at now, we got into a church that is actually a Baptist church. And in this place, we got back to the gospel, uh, just the Bible-based teaching, which is what exactly what we needed in that season of our life. But, you know, many people like myself, we end up tangled in sin, hopeless and lost and have no idea why. We think we aren't spiritual enough. We think we aren't good enough or that we don't have enough faith. There's so many people that have been hurt by being told you don't have enough faith. We don't understand how we got to where we are. We're angry with God. The truth is we began to seek answers in spiritual gifts rather than trust in the finished work of the cross and Jesus himself. We seek a prophetic word over picking up the Bible. We want a powerful sermon rather than spending time in the secret place. We're looking for an emotional experience over a true relationship with the Father, whether we tangibly feel anything or not. We want the gifts, but we don't want the giver. What we lack is total surrender. And that is true for me. In this time of my life, I had zero surrender to authority. I had zero surrender to the Lord. I was going to do it my way. And God was just supposed to come along and join me on that journey. And that's just simply not how it works. And I was deceived. So if you've walked through this or are walking through this, I've put together a couple of things that you can do to get back on track and get out of this. And number one is return to the Word of God. Return to the Gospel. Just start reading your Bible. It is that simple. Just start reading it. Whatever they're telling you in the church, go home and study it. Make sure this lines up. But we have to read the Bible in its entirety. We cannot cherry pick little parts that make for a good sermon and not consider the entire thing. Uh, no, remember what Jesus says in Revelation chapter 2 to the church of Ephesus, who is, he says, you found some of them to be false teachers. And he says, but I have this against you. You've abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So this is Jesus in the end times. He's calling out the body of Christ. He's calling out the church. The Bible uh, prophesies there's going to be a great falling away, a, a great apostasy. And this is what he's talking about. He says, come back to your first love, which is me. It's not all the gifts. It's not all the fluff. It's not all the prophetic stuff. It's not all the schools. It's not all the music. It's me. You're doing this for me because I died for you and because I love you. Psalm 119, 105 says, says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible will never steer you wrong. If you're if you're not sure who to listen to, you're getting conflicting information from people you trust and from leaders, go back to the word of God. God does not condict, contradict himself. If it's not biblical, it's not him. 1 John 4.1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world and the spirit of Antichrist is out and is already here. They, they said that in the Bible, that the spirit of Antichrist was already on the earth. So the enemy is out to deceive and he is uh, working overtime right now in our churches to pull people away from the power of the cross, which is the mercy of God, which allows us to come into repentance when we fail him, when we walk away from him before it's too late, before we pass on from this earth. 
And the second thing is return to the secret place and prayer, Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Y'all, I know this isn't flashy. I know it's not showy. I know people don't all see it and, uh, you know, we don't get a pat on the back, but it says the Lord will reward you. And that is the point. We have a relationship with him. We're saying, God, I care enough about you. I care enough about your heart that I'm going to spend time with you because I want to know more about you. I want to know who this God is. We've tried to minimize him into a way that we can understand him with our human brains, but he's so vast. He's so amazing. Amazing. He cannot be measured. No instrument or tool can be used to measure the God that we serve. And so that is the one we're coming before, a holy, powerful God who sent his son to die for us. And that's the one that we are walking into that room and closing the door and having conversation with. And that blesses the heart of the Lord and it will bless you as well. And the last thing I'm going to share is to fear the Lord. If you've been in this and you're coming out of it, how do you get back on track? You know, fear the Lord. Ecclesiastes 12 says at the end of the matter, this is Solomon talking, um, the richest, wisest man. He said, nothing else in the world matters. He's talking about all is vain, all is lost. Uh, You know, everything sucks pretty much and it's going to hell in a handbasket. But this was his conclusion, like, and what is the meaning of life? What is this all about? He says at the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. Psalms 25, 14 says the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him and he makes known to them his covenant. Uh, Another translation says the secrets of the Lord are for those who fear him. Y'all, if you fear the Lord, if you operate prophetically, if you're seeking prophetic gifts, the fear of the Lord will open the door for those prophetic gifts to come. It's very clear right there that the Lord has friendship. He tells his secrets. He shares, makes known his covenant, his promises, his counsel to those who fear him. And those who fear him keep his commandments. They love what he loves and they hate what he hates. And that is something that the Lord loves. So I, if you're still with me, I'm surprised because this is a, a long video, but I know God wanted me to share this and, and just put this out there for, for anybody who might be struggling as a warning to the body of Christ to watch out for this false doctrine that says that there's basically no sin and that it's all grace and everything's going to be fine and everything's acceptable, you know, no matter what sexual orientation or lifestyle you want to live. And that is just absolutely not true. That is from the pit of hell. That is deception at its at its finest. And um, it's becoming more and more prominent in the church today. And so I hope this blesses your heart. I'll put up my testimony video here if you haven't seen it that I referenced and then also the video from last week. Uh, So y'all be blessed and I'll see you in the next one.